You might find this hard to believe, but what I've got here is equipment that will enable me to measure the velocity of sound, the speed of sound in air. What have we got? Well, first of all, we've got a perspex tube. Now the perspex tube is open here at this end and closed at this end. And I'll measure the distance that the sound will travel. It will travel down this tube. And as I measure that carefully, that is a measure of one meter. I'm going to make a sound here, a very short, sharp sound that will begin here, travel down to the end and back again. This motion, this sound sensor will pick up the initial sound and then pick up the echo. The computer here will uh, analyze the two sounds and be able to uh, indicate the time that it's taken. To measure the time to go from here to here we've got a data logger that is connected to the sound sensor. So the sound sensor will pick up the first sound, the first click, and following that it will pick up the echo and that will be and transferred to the computer here and from that computer we'll be able to read the time. So we will know the two things that we need in order to measure the speed. We'll know the distance. Let's see how that goes. I'll open the PASCO software by double clicking. I'll check to make sure that the data logger is on and then I will tell the computer that the sound sensor is connected to it. And I'll do it by first of all clicking this spot here where it says hardware uh, setup, then moving across here and clicking on the input device here and selecting then sound sensor. So this green line here is an indication that all is well. Uh, I, I'm going to close this window now. I'll click the cross here. And I want uh, to graph the, <clears throat> the sound as it comes in. So I'm going to give two clicks to this icon over here. Go to here to select measurement and click sound sensor or sound intensity and notice now I've got sound intensity here and time here. Now I will adjust the uh, frequency with which I'm going to uh, detect the sound to 5 kilohertz and that's okay and over here I will start the recording. Once I've started that recording I will then make the short sharp sound I'll click my fingers and we will record both the initial sound and the echo. Now let's see what sense we can make of the result that we've got here. Now you'll notice that I've got the hand here. I'm going to move this across to the left hand side. I'll pull this across and across to stretch this out then I'll move this back again and eventually get two spots. First of all where the initial sound was made. So I'm going to take this spot here as where the initial sound was made and I'm going to take this one here as the sound of the echo. I'll click on this icon here in order to add the position of the time. So I'll click this one and drag this down onto here. And I can see there that the time there is 1.467 seconds for where I think the echo is. 1.473 
second. So that's the time. I've got the distance. Now I can work out the velocity. Let's have a look now at the issue of uncertainty, the plus and minus values. To be First of all, we look at the far end. And there you can see this is quite braced up against the end. Then when we have a look at the open end, you can see there's a little bit of an overlap. So the question is, should we take half the scale reading as the uncertainty? The other thing that we should take into account is the, uh, the position where the sound came from. So when I click my fingers, that came from down here somewhere. So when I go like this, the interesting question is just how far did the sound travel? Well, well, here we have to make an estimate. I would say the estimate could be one centimetre, possibly. One to two centimetres. I can't be too certain about the uncertainty, so I'm going to say one centimetre as the uncertainty for the distance. Having a look now at our uncertainty for time, we note to begin with that we have from here to here five divisions. One, two, three, four, five. And the time for that is this figure minus this figure. In other words, 0 0.004 seconds. So that means one division is 0 0.0008 seconds. If we take half a division as being our uncertainty, then our uncertainty then is 0 0.0004. What does that mean? Well, it means that the uh, lower value could be 1.666 seconds, and our upper value could be 1.4674, taking this uh, lower value down here, just looking at that value. Are those values reasonable? Is it reasonable to say that this one, this reading here of 1.4 six seven could will be as low as this division here well that's plenty of uh, space for our uncertainty so we can go with that so filling in this table now so 2d here this is two times the length of the tube so that gives us a figure of two meters plus or minus 0 0.01 metre, our one centimetre uncertainty. And for our time, we've got a figure of 0 0.060 plus or minus 0 0.004 seconds. So let's have a look now at the velocity. Uh, that velocity, of course, will be the, the distance divided by the time. Uh, but let's look, at, first of all, at the uncertainty. What we've got to do here, because we're involving a division, is work in terms of percentage uncertainty. So the percentage uncertainty for the distance is going to be our uncertainty here divided by the total length multiplied by 100. So that gives us 0.5%. With regard to our error for time, that will be this figure here divided by that one times 100. So that would be 6.66 recurring. So we can now work out the percentage error for the velocity. And that, of course, is going to be the sum of these two uncertainties. So that gives us a figure of 7.167%. So if we go to our velocity, which uh, is calculated at 333.3, if we find 7.167% of that, this gives us a figure of 23.87.
what we normally do with uncertainty is we only have one uh, significant figure in our uncertainty. So the significant figure then means that we round uh, this value and that will mean that it is this figure here. So our uncertainty then for our velocity becomes this. We're uncertain about this figure here, so we're rounding that down because it's 3, it's below 5. And here, this is the significant figure when it comes to our uncertainty. So this is the value then for our velocity of sound. We're saying it could be as low as 310 or as high as 350 using the equipment that we've been using. Let's have a look, go back and have a look at the process of method. This is important. Uh, in writing a scientific report, it's quite important to be able to, first of all, to write the, the method in past tense and to, as it says here, to include a label diagram. So what we've got here is the equipment the kind of diagram that we should end up with is something like this, where we've got here the Perspex tube and each of these labels. Now notice how when we're drawing these diagrams, we do it in two dimensions. So we don't do a three dimensional diagram and we include the labels. Everything there should be labeled and we have them in perspective. In other words, we have the length of these things appropriate to uh, the length that they are actually uh, in form. And we'll include here the computer because the computer is an important part of it. The lines that we have here are not arrows, they are simple straight lines which go to the items that we're looking at. When we're drawing these figures, the use of a ruler is very important. It keeps these diagrams neat. Moving on, what we need to do now is write down the steps that were taken. And as I said, we do this in past tense. Usually the first step that you can write in a method is the equipment was set up as shown in the diagram. Now this takes many words away from the number that you have to write for your method and it's a simple way of introducing your method. The next thing that you should you could say here is to say something about the short sharp sound that was made at the opening of the tube. Do this, mention how it was made. Describe what the sound sensor does. Mention the software, the PASCO software that was used to monitor the sound. Now the importance of doing that is that when you are writing a method, you are writing it so that somebody else, somewhere else in the, in the world, can repeat your experiment. So if you have been using a particular app, PASCO, for this task, then you should mention that. Just don't say a computer was used. Describe how the time was calculated from the graph of the sound. Refer to the length of the tube and how the distance the sound travelled was calculated. Explain how the data that has now been collected was used to actually determine the velocity. So these are the points that you should be able to write about, that you should be able to include in your method. Our next task is to calculate the theoretical speed given the temperature of the air in the room. Now, the temperature of the air in the room was in air-conditioned laboratory, and that was 23 degrees Celsius. So you can substitute in for capital T there, uppercase T, 23, and work out what the velocity of sound was expected to be. The first thing that we can say when we are comparing the two velocities is, are they the same or are they different? 
Are they higher or are they lower? Now, if they are higher or lower, um, does that result occur within the range of uncertainty that we worked out for our experiment? You can think through this yourself and answer that question in this space. The next thing to do is to identify the factors that might change the velocity of sound in air. Well, one particular thing, of course, is the temperature. Another thing that can change the velocity of sound in air is what is in the air, particularly water vapour. So on a damp, wet day, we might expect the sound to travel at a different speed. Next question. If we fill the tube with helium gas, what might happen to the velocity? Well, let's just think of what uh, temperature means, first of all. The helium gas would be at the same temperature as the nitrogen and the oxygen that's in the air. So the kinetic energy of the helium molecule or atom would have the same kinetic energy as the oxygen and the nitrogen. Oxygen and nitrogen have a larger mass. So that means that at the same, with the same kinetic energy, the uh, air molecules would have a lower velocity. The helium gas would be vibrating, moving about at a much higher speed than the uh, oxygen and the nitrogen. So that would suggest that the sound would travel more quickly through helium. As a conclusion to this experiment, we've got to go back to our aim. What was that aim? That aim was to find the velocity of sound in air. So this is what you would write in this space. The velocity of sound in air in this experiment was, and you would write in the number. You would also have a brief comment saying it was the same as, it was higher than, it was lower than, what was theoretically expected. I trust that this has been helpful in enabling you to write up this particular experiment.